Okay, so I've listed you here sort of a few of these prescription uh, or these different components from a physical model standpoint, but now I'm going to reframe them as an observer standpoint into sort of questions that I think are answerable as observers. So the first set are uh, questions about mass inflow. Basically, we want to understand what are conditions like near an accreting black hole so we can understand how the gas moves from you know, giant scales to small scales to tiny scales to the black hole scale. And we want to understand then how quickly these black holes grow and when in galaxy evolution it's important. And then the second set of questions have to do with what happens after you have outflowing gas. So we want to understand you know, how collimated are AGN-driven outflows. So that's like, are they a wide area, wide angle outflows, or are they tiny pencil beam type outflows? Do they disrupt or heat how much of the ISM in these galaxies? And then we also want to understand the multi-phase structure of the gas. Right? So maybe we're only dumping out really hot gas and all the cool gas gets stuck nearby. Right? But the cool gas is what forms stars, and so that's maybe what you care most about. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you through a couple of these questions here today. And uh, first, I want to take you back to this merger picture. Right? So this is a, uh, a concept where basically we take disk galaxies, regular isolated disk galaxies, and you smash them into each other. Right? And so then the idea is that over the course of this merger, you end up driving all the gas and the uh, dust into the center, and then you end up forming stars and feeding the black hole. And then over the course of this progression, that's how you use this AGN feedback to translate these disk galaxies into ellipticals. All right, so it's the same picture that I sort of talked about earlier that, remember, we said was a little too simplistic to answer all of our questions. Um, but it turns out that you know, this process does happen in at least some galaxies. Right? And uh, if you were noticing, these two panels here in the center, they show basically the uh, black hole growth on the bottom panel and the star formation rate on the top panel. And so what you can see as a function of these different stages of the process is that uh, right here in the middle where we have this merger going on, we have lots of star formation and lots of black hole growth. So if you want to study how AGN feedback is affecting star formation rate, this could be a really good place to look in order to make sure that you have these processes going on. Okay, so uh, this asterisk is just to say that, yes, there are other places where physics happens in galaxies, uh, and so we're not answering all the questions, but this is a really good laboratory if we want to understand uh, sort of how these physical processes interact. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we turn to the Great Observatory All Sky LURG survey. So LURGs are luminous infrared galaxies, uh, and essentially in the nearby universe, they're all these giant train wreck mergers here, which have a lot of dust and star formation and AGN activity going on in the center. Right, so that makes them uh, very bright in the infrared. And this survey over many years has basically looked at them with all sorts of different observatories. Basically anything we could get our hands on. It started out with Spitzer, Hubble, Galax, and Chandra, but it's moved on to like Herschel and VLA radio data, etc. And so part of the reason why this sample is really useful is because multi-wavelength data is going to give us the most complete picture about the black hole activity and the star formation activity in these galaxies. Okay, so here's where you know our story begins. Uh, but the thing about most of these uh, observatories is that they're relatively small telescopes with relatively poor spatial resolution. So the only one of these that has really excellent spatial resolution is the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, from there we learned that these galaxies are really complicated inside, which is kind of by construction, right? We looked for galaxies that were the most complex uh, and going everything was going on at once. But what we realize, of course, is that if you want to disentangle all of these complex things that are going on at once, you really need to be able to spatially disentangle them uh, in order to get it right. So I'm showing you here a picture from Hubble of one of our galaxies, NGC 6240. So if you zoom way in into the Hubble image, you can see that it's split into two nuclei. 
Uh, so this is also from Hubble in the I-band. And so that's just moving a little bit red word. And so we're looking through a lot of the dust towards the center. Uh, but now if we zoom even further in onto this box with adaptive optics from Keck in the near infrared, you can see that actually these sort of two nuclei sort of change morphology a lot. So there is a black hole right here and a black hole right about here. Uh, because there are these two galaxies that are merging. And so the black holes, each galaxy comes with its own black hole. And so these black holes haven't merged yet. Uh, and so here they are. Uh, so you can see that even in the I-band, we basically don't see this black hole. right? It's right about here. But it's so covered up in dust that it's invisible. A question. Yeah. You can see the black hole. So the resolution is pretty good. Why don't you see any other small structure? Um, so... Uh, you can see like lots of little star clusters going on around here, but what kind of structure were you looking for? In the big blobs. Why are the big blobs so smooth? You mean these? Um, part of it is because there was a relatively smooth structure. Uh, so these are nuclear disks. Uh, part of it is, well, so... I guess I'll ask it differently. Yeah. Was the black hole enhanced? No. Uh, well, so the, the, the north nucleus, you can see there's like a, a sharp line, and basically the color scale of this stuff is uh, a different scale than the color scale inside of that line, just so that you can see the faint stuff and the bright stuff. But uh, aside from that, you know, we didn't like change the PSF or smooth anything or anything like that. Does that answer your question? Okay. How far are these two? Uh, so they are uh, about one and a half arc seconds on the sky, which is about 800 parsecs. So it's, it's not quite resolvable by Chandra. It's like almost resolvable, and you can sort of do some funny things, but uh, yeah, it's tricky. So the technique that I've used for this adaptive optics, which I'm uh, invoking as a key way that we can, from the ground, do better than Hubble uh, is this really neat technique, which I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about since you might not be familiar with it. Uh, but basically, you know, everyone remembers the song Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? And that's because blurring in the Earth's atmosphere makes these stars twinkle, right? So all the turbulence in our atmosphere, these different pockets of air at slightly different temperatures, they make these stars, which are beautiful point sources for uh, you know, millions of light years as they're coming towards us, then in the last possible instant as they go through our atmosphere, get all distorted. And so instead of this nice, beautiful planar wavefront, we end up with this distorted wavefront. And so then we become very sad uh, as astronomers. But what we can do is take a mirror and distort it in exactly the right way so that these distorted wavefronts get canceled out. And so uh, basically the idea is we distort them uh, by this adaptive mirror, and then you end up with this beautiful corrected wavefront. Uh, but the trick is that, of course, distortion in the Earth's atmosphere is changing at like a 1,000 times a second. And so what we have to do is measure this distortion and change the adaptive mirror like a 1,000 times a second. But <coughs> if you can do this, then uh, you have a lot of really awesome power. So this is an example uh, from uh, the MMT adaptive optic system, where essentially if you take uh, a picture of this star companion, uh, so this is the actual image, or then this is like a surface contour kind of 3D plot of, of the image, you can see that this star basically just gets blurred out into this Gaussian seeing disk is what we call it. Okay, that's because as the turbulence moves, some of the light gets scattered here now, and here now, and here now, and then it all sort of averages out into this blob. Okay, but if you can use this deformable mirror to basically scatter the light back to where it belongs, you end up piling all the photons up where they belong, right here in the center. And so you can see that not only does this help with your spatial resolution, but it also helps with your sensitivity because now these really faint things, which were really hard to see because they were all blurred out, now the photons are piled up on top of each other so they <coughs> pop out. 
And in this example, you know, not only can you actually resolve that this faint blob is two things, but there's also this teeny tiny other thing that you had no hope of seeing uh, in the first place. And if that's not convincing enough, I'll show you the galactic center. Right, so this is our galactic center of the Milky Way. And so you can see here that essentially not only are we doing a better job of resolving stars, separating them out spatially from each other, but you can see things that are too faint just sort of pop into existence. Right. So this is the technique that we're using to recover really high spatial resolution observations of these nuclei with our uh, adaptive optics. Okay, so this is work that we do essentially in the near infrared because adaptive optics gets easier the longer the wavelength you go to. But if you go much further than near infrared, then the atmosphere gets too hot and so we can't do it from the ground. Um, you said that with the two black holes there, how did you, what were they identified with? I mean, rotational velocities or? Um, so actually, so with Chandra. Okay, so they're X-ray sources. Yeah, so they are X-ray sources. They're pretty obscured. Um, their column densities are quite high, but yeah, so with, with Chandra, we can just barely uh, basically separate them. Did SWIFT take a look at these as well? Because they got that hard x ray. Which yeah, but their PSF is much worse than Chandra. Good yeah. Point. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay. Uh, so, adaptive optics is one super amazing technique which I highly advocate uh, that we use, but there's another one that we use which is called integral field spectroscopy. So uh, before this technique, astronomers essentially chose, do I want a picture, you know, a regular camera snapshot where I pick maybe a certain wavelength, uh, and then, or what you could do is you could add up all the light from your galaxy and then split it by wavelength and get a spectrum. Right, and so spectroscopy is really powerful because then you can look at things like emission lines or absorption lines, uh, which tells us things about ionization, chemistry, uh, the state of the gas, and also a little bit about the kinematics. But integral field spectroscopy is much better than either of these because we get a data cube, or essentially we end up with an image where every pixel in our image is a, itself a spectrum. So now everything that you could do with a single spectrum of a galaxy, now you can do across the face of the galaxy. Uh, perhaps hundreds of times. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what we want to do. Okay, so uh, the survey that I'm here to argue for is called the Koala Goal Survey. All right, so this is a subset of goals galaxies where we have looked at with Keck Osiris, which is this near infrared integral field spectrograph that sits behind the adaptive optics system. And so what this allows us to do is look at the very nuclei of a bunch of these galaxies uh, in order to separate out a bunch of uh, interesting physical processes. So I'm showing you here just a few of the first galaxies that we got to show you that some of them are you know, very smooth and simple looking, uh, but some of them are very clumpy and complex, right? And so some of them are complex such that, you know, because they have two nuclei. And some of them are complex, like one of these, where you know, there's just a lot of clumps of star formation. And so if we, didn't, if we only had an image, you would look at this and you would not know that you know, this galaxy has two black holes, whereas this galaxy only has one. But because we have spectra for each of these individual clumps and, and pixels, then we're able to disentangle that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, most of this work is done in the K band, which is around two microns. So I wanted to show you an individual spectrum just from uh, one of our galaxies so you can get a sense of what we're looking at in each pixel of these data cubes. So the first thing is we see these deep absorption band heads here uh, on the right hand side. So these, this is uh, absorption that happens in the atmospheres of hot stars or massive stars. Right, and so essentially they need to be relatively young because those stars don't live very long. So we see these really deep band heads which tells us about you know, if the stars are young or not, if there are young stars, and also how the stars are moving, the stellar kinematics. So this really sharp band head edge on the left side makes it actually a really good kinematic tracer because you, you know, it's not a broad line to begin with, but it's a really sharp feature. Uh, then we have five transitions of shocked molecular gas, right? So these are rho vibrational transitions of molecular hydrogen. 
So looking at the different ratios of these uh, rho vibrational transitions can tell us a little bit about the excitation temperature of the molecular gas. We also have ionized gas tracers like bracket gamma and bracket delta that are good tracers of star formation. And then I wouldn't argue that you see it in this galaxy, but if there were an AGN br shining brightly, it would excite a line here at silicon 6. Right, so silicon 6 is a, is a line with such a high excitation potential that essentially it's very hard to get it any other way than an AGN. So with just this one spectrum, we get quite a lot of information about all these different physical processes that are going on. And remember, we get them in a physical, uh, in a spatially resolved sense. So taking you back, remember, these are the ideas that we want to test and constrain observationally so that we know more about our AGN feedback prescriptions, right? So to start with, you know, we want to think about what are conditions like near an accreting black hole. So the first thing that we learned from our sample is that nuclear disks around these black holes are nearly ubiquitous. We see them in almost every uh, galaxy nucleus that we look at. And essentially, we see them in every tracer that we look at. We see that there's ionized gas, there is this molecular, warm molecular gas component, and we see young stars, right? They're stars that are so young that they're formed uh, during the course of the merger. And we see it in galaxies that have two nuclei and galaxies that have one, which means that even if you destroy the disks, they reform really quickly after they coalesce. And so these galaxy disks, these nuclear disks, are sort of a ten, few tens to few hundreds of parsec scale radius. And they're turbulent. They have V over sigma of a factor of a few. Do you have to keep the disks to conserve the angular momentum? That's why you have to um, I mean, yes, that's probably why they form. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, speaking of angular momentum, you know, remember this bond hoyle accretion rate prescription that everybody uses? That assumes that gas has no angular momentum. And so this right here tells us something that's a little bit concerning, which is this accretion rate prescription is perhaps not appropriate, at least for these galaxies, and probably for any galaxies that are gas rich in the center. Yeah. Okay, and we're not the only ones who see this. Um, there's a, a large body of work uh, looking at other sorts of galaxies, including these are non-mergers, where basically if you match AGN galaxies and quiescent galaxies, the AGN galaxies have diskier kinematics in the nuclei. Right? So again, that's an idea that it's not just these gas-rich mergers for which bond hoyle accretion rate prescriptions might not be so good, but maybe many more. Okay, so the first thing we learn is that near an accreting black hole, conditions are disky, so bond hoyle accretion is maybe risky. <laughs> <laughs> not going to forget that one. Uh, okay, so now we want to think about black holes and how they grow. Right, so remember we talked about how uh, black holes correlate well with host galaxy properties. We know black holes grow during gas rich mergers, right? Because we see AGN turn on, we see star formation grow, turn on. So galaxies grow, black holes grow. Uh, and so we think before the merger, maybe they lie here, and after the merger, they've somehow moved up and along because there's nothing special about them before the merger or after the merger. Does the new galaxy end up with two black holes then? Mm, we think eventually they collide. They merge into one. Yeah, so you, you might imagine that even if you didn't have any extra black hole growth, that you would, uh, you would just sum the two black holes and sum the two galaxies, and then they would stay on this relation. Uh, but we know that there's new star formation that happens, at least in gas-rich systems, and new it's black a, it's hole growth. It's well, no, that's true. But there's a lot of scatter, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, you know, but we don't really understand how this transition happens, right? And uh, gas-rich mergers happen over hundreds of millions or maybe even a billion years. And so we could ask questions like, you know, can we learn anything by what their, these mergers should look like on this, right? So you could imagine that over the course of the merger, the black hole and the host galaxy might just grow in lockstep. You know, I get a little bit of gas, you get a little bit of gas, we work it out and we stay on the relation, but eventually, you know, somehow we move up together. Or you could imagine that early in the merger, the black hole grows 
really quickly, and then somehow it gives up, it stops, and then you know star formation happens, so the stellar mass goes up, uh, and so then it moves sort of back to the right and eventually ends up on scaling relations. Or you could imagine the opposite, where star formation happens over the course of the merger, and then eventually somehow the AGM turns on, and then in some sort of quasar burst of feedback, it shuts off all the star formation. Right, and so then you would jump back up as you increase the black hole mass and stop growing the galaxy. Right, so this last one here is sort of that canonical picture that I showed you from simulations early on. Okay, so what we need to do in order to look at this picture is basically to measure black hole masses in our systems. And it's really hard in these complex systems because all of the ways that we traditionally would measure black hole masses don't work. You know, we like to measure the kinematics of everything in the galaxy, uh, but that's called Schwarzschild three integral modeling. And essentially, you can't do that in a system that's not virialized, it's not relaxed. So you can just throw that away. A lot of uh, the other ways that we do involve looking at the broadline region around the black hole, things like reverberation mapping. Uh, but you can't do that because we don't have broadline regions because we have too much dust in the center. Uh, so basically, what we want is a dynamical mass measurement inside the sphere of influence of the black hole, which of course, you know, is, is easier because the relaxation times are shorter close to the black hole. And remember, we have really high spatial resolution data, so it could be feasible with our data set. So what I'm showing you here is close to this south black hole in 6240, which is right around here, remember? So this is the stellar uh, velocity map. So you can see sort of this red to blue transition shows a really steep velocity gradient around the black hole, which is the kind of thing that you only get when you have a really large mass in the center. So what we can do is we can measure a, a mass profile based on the velocity map. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's just call it a thin Keplerian disk and we'll measure some mass profile and we'll see if that tells us anything about the black hole. It should give us a lower limit because we're ignoring velocity dispersion. Uh, but we basically fit a point source of almost 10 to the 9 solar masses, right, which is quite significant, uh, but not out of the question. Okay, we can also, you know, we worry about that lower limit designation because we are ignoring the velocity dispersion. But if we incorporate it and essentially now fit uh, velocity, dis velocity squared plus velocity dispersion squared instead, uh, then we end up with an upper limit because some of our velocity dispersion is this unvirialized junk between us and the nucleus. So we end up with an upper limit of about 2 times 10 to the 9 solar masses, which actually isn't that far off from our lower limit, so we felt relatively confident. So we said, okay, well, we'll just repeat this for a bunch of other galaxies. Okay, so remember what we want to do is figure out if they lie above scaling relations, uh, below scaling relations, or on them. And that will tell us a little bit about the time scales over which black holes grow relative to their host galaxies. Okay, and remember also that we were expecting them to lie below. However, all of these gas-rich mergers are these bright colored points on top of regular isolated galaxies, which are the black points. So you can see that actually they're lying above scaling relations, which is odd. Yeah? It's the size of the point, the error part, what's the, um, what's the lower upper limit range? Uh, what, what, have you, what have you plotted here? What have I plotted here? So this is Could essentially- you like a lower and an upper limit. Oh yeah, so uh, for those galaxies, uh, basically, so the stellar disks are the lower limit and the jam modeling is the upper limit. And so for galaxies where we could do both, like this blue point here, you get two points. So one pointing up and one pointing down, yeah. Um, so because these are really obscured systems, I would think that the stellar mass or even the H-band luminosities or even the velocity dispersions might be subject to significant amounts of extinction, which would drive all the points that way. And so I'm wondering how you get around, because these things have like 20 magnitudes of extinction toward the center, right? So I guess I'm just trying to figure out how that's accounted for in thinking about the placement on the x-axis. Yeah, good question. So the uh, extinction bar that we expect, uh, the errors is actually this tiny oh. red arrow here in the left, okay. uh, just for the middle panel, basically because this is the... Uh, you know, we think it's not the, the bulge overall, you know, it's a lot of extinction right here in the center, but the overall extinction for the bulge is not nearly so significant, especially when you go to H-band. Okay. Um, 
And like total stellar mass, this is a, an SED fit to many, many band photometry. Yeah. Your, your point about the velocity dispersion, though, is valid. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, we see with all of three of these scaling relations that our points are lying above scaling relations. So, you know, that was odd. It either tells us that our canonical picture of how black holes grow relative to their host galaxies and this possible feedback exchange is completely wrong, opposite of what we thought, or there's something else a little bit more complicated going on. And so what we think is probably the most plausible solution is the idea that gas, you know, as these galaxies are merging, they're funneling this gas towards the center of the black uh, center towards the black holes. And then uh, it basically takes a long time to get there. So if these black holes start claiming their mass, let's say these circumnuclear disks have some pile up below our resolution limit. Right, so imagine we're measuring the kinematics on this disk out here. But if there's another sort of pile up inside our central pixel, that's the black hole plus the black hole accretion disk plus maybe whatever other structure is feeding the black hole accretion disk, we would just call that all a black hole mass because it looks like a point source to us. And so essentially we're like, well, okay, that's one possible explanation and so it would be artificially inflating all of our black holes. And maybe this is matter that will eventually accrete onto the black hole. So they're not unreasonable black hole masses for the end. But if they haven't accreted yet, then feedback shouldn't have happened. So maybe it takes a long time. Yeah? Do you have any sense for, is there even a way to get um, the time scales, the time scales that you live above that relation before you come uh, over? So. Well, so this I'm showing you is just our the first set of our data with you know, 10 or 11 different black holes. They're mostly in late merger stages, but we've actually, remember I, the Koala survey has more than, more than 30 now, and so our next goal is basically to do this, but separate by merger stage. So we can say like, okay, well, in stage one, you are not yet above the scaling relation, and in stage two, you magically jump, or you not yet. So in that sense, we probably can at least address the question a little bit. I'm just, I'm just wondering, the delayed feedback model um, is correct, like how long would it actually take your gas to get from one radius to down to the other radius? Yeah, good question. So uh, there are a couple of simulations. Uh, so if you think back to those accretion rate prescription simulations, like the one that's viscous accretion, like accretion through a viscous disk, this turbulence in a viscous accretion disk, you know, it depends a lot on the properties of the, you know, the density of the gas and how turbulent it is, temperature, et cetera, but could be, could be up to a giga year, okay. you know, depending on properties, right? So, which are completely unconstrained at this point. Yeah, but it's, it's not physically impossible. Yeah, so essentially, this was our hypothesis. We said, okay, well, if we aren't breaking all of physics, or all of you know our canonical picture, then we predict ex an excess of molecular gas inside the central sort of few tens of parsecs inside our central pixel, right? And so every time somebody says we predict this, you should ask them, great, how will you test it? And uh, so of course uh, we were excited to be able to test it with Alma. So Alma is the Atacama Large some millimeter array. This is a you know a big interferometer in Chile, which enables studies of molecular gas at you know the highest spatial resolutions that we currently can. And so we have that data first for NGC 6240, which are two of the black holes on the plot, um, but we have more coming soon. Uh, so what I'm showing you here, this is back to this near infrared image of the stars. So there's the black holes here and here on the left. And then here on the right on the same scales lined up, these white contours show the continuum in the submillimeter. Uh, which line up well with these two black holes. And then the color scale is the CO2 to 1. So this is uh, basically the dust continuum and the cold gas, uh, subject to a lot of question marks. OK, so this galaxy was known to be very bizarre because it has all of this gas, not in the nuclei, but between them. Uh, and essentially, you know, that's a topic for another paper. 
Uh, but what I'm really going to just focus on right now is can we try to understand how much molecular gas is there on, inside our resolution limit of our OSIRIS data. So there are two ways to do that. Basically, we can use the continuum measurement and say there's this much dust and there's some standard dust to gas ratio, so there's this much gas. Or you can use the CO2 to 1 and say here is our uh, estimate for how much gas that luminosity relates to. And so when we do that, we translate. Uh, so this purple line shows basically the resolution limit of our OSIRIS data. And if you look, you can see actually quite a significant amount, sort of 10 to the 8, uh, a few times 10 to the 8 solar masses of gas. So I'm showing you these plots of our scaling relations again, but I've taken off all the other points and just left you with the north and south nuclei of uh, so these two black holes. So this, these were our original uh, limits. On, on the black hole masses. And now if we subtract off the amount of molecular gas we think that there should be, you can see that depending on which of those uh, measurements you use, they, the corrections are sort of on the order of 5 to perhaps as high as 90%. Right? So uh, that is easily potentially enough uh, in the south nucleus, although not at all in the north. Yeah? So the, this gas is it close enough to the black hole that you definitely think it's going to accrete onto the black hole? Definitely is a strong word because remember, like, if you turn on the AGN partway through, all bets are off. We know that there are these massive molecular outflows in other galaxies, and so they have to be collecting molecular gas from somewhere. So half of this might end up somewhere else if the AGN, you know, if the first half accretes and drives feedback, then it might ditch the other half, or it might not. Do you see the AGM at all directly at these wavelengths with all? Do you expect any contribution from the black hole itself rather than just the dust? Um, no, but at these resolutions, like we only have band 6 data. So it would be really interesting, I mean, because that's the highest spatial resolution we can access right now. But uh, it would be really cool to do uh, multi, multi band. I know our black hole at least is still quite bright in the ALMA bands. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, 6 to 90% is kind of a big range. Mm. So what's the... Well, so basically for, for the north black hole, yeah. it's 6 to 11%. Okay, so we're going to miss... Right. And for the south black hole, it's like 10 to 90%. And why is it so much higher for the south? Well, because uh, the there's quite a bit more continuum emission in the south. Gotcha. So, so it could be contributing a lot. More. It could be contributing a lot more. It could be that, you know, one of our assumptions is, you know, a better representation in one nucleus than the other. But right now we actually don't know which. Uh, and so we're basically, by using continuum and CO, like they both are sort of assumptions that you make, but they're basically independent assumptions that you make, and they're ones that we make in all other ALMA studies, essentially. So, uh, you said this was per beam as well, so is there a way to confirm that you're not getting stuff outside of the, the, the actual spherical gravitational influence of the black hole? I, I mean, I'm assuming that the ALMA data came with enough spectra to do that, but I don't know how high resolution the um, information would have been. Yeah, I don't know. The, um, yeah, the, so this, this red line here is, is basically the fullest half max of the ALMA beam. So it is smaller, you know, by 50% than our resolution limit, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this seems really extreme and uh, ridiculous. You know, is it surprising? You know, and Maybe not, because there are a whole bunch of other galaxies where we're starting to see that there could be this significant amount of molecular gas. Other similar galaxies like ARP220, but also uh, a sample of sort of regular isolated Seaford galaxies which have this AGN, right? And some simulations also show that, you know, cold gas could make up a significant fraction uh, close to these black holes. But I'll argue also that, you know, all the studies are also showing uh, galaxies with no comparable central molecular gas mass right in the center. 
Uh, but these, these galaxies here that we have this high resolution data for that don't show it are also not AGN. And yeah. Those are not mergers. Correct. Yeah. So. Yeah, but these are also not mergers. Yeah, uh, that's true. Okay. It'd be better to look at mergers that don't have AGN. Let's just get more all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just get it. Here, you get me some and we'll do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so what we've learned is that there could be lots of mass in the central 20 to 40 parsecs of at least some galaxies, maybe more like AGN or at least gas rich systems. Uh, right? This could be fuel, necessary fuel to turn on the AGN. Uh, you know, and or, as we were saying, some of it could be, uh, could be blown out in molecular outflows. So. Um, we also have more data coming from cycle six and cycle seven. Okay, so uh, basically these are, you know, going back to our questions about mass inflow, remember we learned that conditions are disky, not black hole accretion, Bondi accretion uh, for black holes. Uh, and also we've learned that Plausibly, there's you know some significant amount of delay between mass inflow and AGN activity, especially if in your simulations you're only resolving like kiloparsec scales or 100 parsec scales. There's got to it's got to take some time to get down there. Okay, um, so essentially, I'm thinking so I could talk a little bit about the feedback <coughs> options, but plausibly, I'm just going to skip to the end. So trust me, and I'll show you if you're interested, uh, that you know, we can, with the same data sets, learn things. We can identify uh, feedback, you know, signs of outflows on these ionized gas and molecular gas scales. And so what I'm showing you here is simulation from fire, where this is showing basically a histogram of density and temperature of the gas particles that are outflowing. And so what you can see is that uh, at different times during this merger, if my computer can handle the simulation, you know, we get hot gas outflowing and then sometimes we get uh, even down to the cold molecular gas outflows. Uh, and so if we take just one of these snapshots, uh, if we combine our OSIRIS data, which is probing these ionized gas outflows all the way down to our warm molecular outflows, and then we combine our ALMA data, with these cold molecular gas outflows, then uh, we can provide a really powerful constraint on feedback. Uh, but I just want to warn you that comparing between phases and different tracers is a really dangerous kind of game. So a lot of people, once we started to get past the idea that like it's okay to look in different wavelengths, um, people started to do it a lot. But it's very scary because uh, things that you would expect maybe aren't quite so true. So what I'm showing you here uh, is an example outflow. So this is this warm molecular hydrogen line from uh, one of our galaxies that shows uh, a super wind. And this outflow has been seen by many other authors in many other tracers. And so what I'm showing you here, so I like naturally you would think, okay, higher velocities must be the hotter gas. Right, hotter gas is moving at higher velocities and the cold molecular gas is denser, so it's harder to accelerate. So you'd expect that the low velocity stuff ought to be the molecular gas and the high velocity stuff ought to be the ionized gas. But instead, what you see is they basically all span the whole range. Um, so the neutral stuff is sort of in the middle, but you have molecular gas on either side and ionized gas on either side of that, um, which is terrifying. Uh, it's essentially because, you know, these outflow velocities that we calculate, it depends on the way you measure it. Uh, but also a lot of it really depends on the spatial resolution of your data, right? And so what I was showing you here is multi-wavelength data at matched spatial resolutions, which is really important because if you average over, you know, a kiloparsec in this tracer and, you know, 10 parsecs in this tracer, you're obviously going to get different answers even if, uh, you know, even if they're both present. And then the other thing is that because these different tracers are at different wavelengths, the optical depth, how much stuff you're looking through, and so the physical location even along the line of sight that you're tracing is different. So that's really sort of scary too. Okay, uh, so, you know, I'll remind you of our questions for mass outflow. Basically we want to understand things like how collimated are the AGN driven outflows, 
what volume of the interstellar medium do they heat or disrupt, and then what does this multi-phase structure look like? And I'll just say that in small samples, which we've gotten so far, they all seem pretty variable. And that's because we're not doing a good enough job of standard looking at it in a standard way. Um, but more data are coming, both from us and essentially like everyone on every telescope in the world. And so that's going to hopefully be uh, something that we're learning about soon. OK. Um, so with that, I'll remind you, we have high spatial resolution matched multi-phase spatial and kinematic data sets. And they're telling us things like our black hole accretion rate prescriptions are important and we should think about them. Uh, there could be this delay between mass <coughs> moving towards the black hole and this actual feedback turning on, which we've been ignoring. <coughs> and then outflows are multi-phase, uh, but we really need detailed structure. Uh, and those studies are now starting to be in reach. Uh, so all of our OSIRIS data we're going to make public. If you're interested, can think of any reasons to use them, let me know, and we're happy to share. Um, and, and here's our survey website if you're interested. All right, thanks. <laughs>